welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 18, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on September 28, 2005. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, makers of Battleground Fantasy Warfare, the miniature war game without miniatures. To learn more about Your Move Games or to take a flash demo of Battleground, please visit www.yourmovegames.com. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. Hi, this is Tom Vassell, and welcome back to episode 18 as we look back at an episode that we did several years ago, or at least a few years ago. I find it interesting how looking back at this episode and then looking at the episode that I just recorded a couple days ago, episode 124, in episode 124, at the end, we're kind of begging people to send us questions. If you listen to this episode, we're doing questions till over half the show is over. And that's just, you know, some people thought we did too many questions, and I can understand that to some degree. But for me, the questions kind of gave us a framework to build on, and I kind of miss having all those questions. Nowadays, you know, we are picking random questions and stuff, but I no, I, I like questions, and it was a fun part of the show. But the show progresses, the show changes on. Uh, you can tell maybe by this time that we're getting a little tired of our intro music. I'm starting to actually have intro segments like the kangaroo music and the turkey music. And I think maybe this is 18 episodes into the series. Maybe we were starting to get a little bit more professional at this point. We certainly were talking off each other pretty well. So we'll have to wait and see, and just listen to this episode, and we'll talk a little bit about more when it's over. But for now, here you go, our show. All right, welcome to the Dice Tower. This is Tom Vassell. And I'm Joe. That was really abrupt there, Tom. Nice, uh, smooth (laughs) transition. i got to work on that transition (laughs) out. Uh, For those of you just tuning in, uh, this is the Dice Tower. It's a podcast about board games. Uh, tabletop games, but mostly board games. Mostly Although board games. That's we're not what we opposed like. to pretty much any kind of game that doesn't have anything to do with the computer. Yes, we we we, we even like role playing games. Yeah, and, and matter of fact, we will never. <laughs> no, 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 you talk about it. Okay, so <laughs> we like all kinds of games, but our biggest our biggest thing that's dear to our hearts is board games. Right. For me, all styles. All styles for Joe. It's mostly. No more board games, but he's. I'm more eclectic. I'm, what's that? Eclectic? I'm more eclectic he, than Tom. Tom's he's a, a closet. Tom he's is a closet lover of games. He, yeah, Tom. He just uh, he only goes with one type. He's so close-minded. But but do you think my one type is really being that close-minded? <laughs> it's, a, it's a diverse one type. <laughs> so, but we're really glad. This is a great show. We had our biggest participation in contest yet, and we're yeah. going to uh, give you who won that contest right after these reviews. But before we get into our reviews. We want to thank uh, GameFest.com for hosting the show. That's where you can find our shows at www.GameFest.com. And the GameWire. I'm slowly posting our shows in different podcast directories around the Internet. If you happen to be part of one of those, uh, go vote for us so we get a higher ranking. Yeah, because we want to rule the world. That's true, right. <laughs> and also, you can visit our webpage www.thedicetower.com uh, right, and at Dice, when you get there you can find a link to both Tom and I's separate pages and Tom has a, a page where he has a, a vast library of resources of game reviews and junk but even more importantly each week we do our top 10 list and you can go to our, our Dice Tower main page and you can click there and it will give you more information on each of the games that sure. we mentioned and then you can go also from there. You can go to my. I have a blog that I update every so often. You can go and see there too. Occasionally we get caught up um, talking about games and, and saying maybe uh, too quickly. We just assume that you know about all these games. So if you do yeah. need more help, we recommend going to our site or going to www.boardgamegeek.com, and there's all kinds of information about games there. Sure. Yep. Speaking of games, here's Joe with a review of Liberty. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I, I'll do the review first, I guess. <laughs> well, you already told me that, didn't you? Yes. All right, yeah, I'm going to review a game called Liberty. Now, uh, this is a first for me for reviewing games uh, because this is a game that, and I'm, I guess I'm going to give away my thunder right off the bat, this is a game that I'm not too sure that I like. Usually the, the past few games that I've done in the past, I guess, what, what show number is this? This is show 18. How, so many, re- how many reviews have you done, like 15 or so? Of about 15 or so. All right, yeah. Well, this is the first one I've done of, of a game that I really, I guess I don't like. Uh, Liberty is a block game, and it covers the American Revolution. It's put out by Columbia Games. Um, and it's, it's very similar, I guess you would say, to Hammer of the Scots, 
but it's not nearly as uh, streamlined, and the rules are a little bit more. There, if you know the word, the world is the word is fiddly. Uh, it's it's kind of a board gaming word, I think. But fiddly, the rules are kind of fiddly. There's a lot of little rules um, that mess you up, and really, there's a, there's a huge randomness factor to the game. You have to roll every turn to see if the French will enter the game. And it's, it's not scaled at all, meaning every turn it doesn't get easier. You know, in some games you'll add a plus one to your die roll per turn that you've played to make it easier. Not in this. So theoretically, the French might never come in. They might come in at first one. You never know. And it's a major part of the game. Um, the good things about it, though, it's got a really low counter den- uh, a low counter density. I like the low counter. With not, I think there's like 25 or 26 pieces per side. Uh, the game's pretty uh, tight for the British. The map's pretty, but it, it's it's like that cardboard uh, cereal box material that they've been doing lately, and I don't I don't mind that too much. But the the map itself is like twice as big as it needs to be. Seventy five percent of the game is fought on the top third of the map. The whole bottom, you know, two thirds of the map is just kind of a waste of space, at least in the seven or eight times I've played the game. Um, and then in the card draw, it's it's a card driven game, and um, it's not really a card driven game. Not like We the People or Hammer. I mean, or um, um, Car- uh, Hannibal, uh, Hannibal Carthage versus Rome. It's not card driven in that aspect, but it's, the combat system is card driven, and so it's very um, random, I guess. And I don't know if I like that the aspect of it. Um, and it's more complex than Hammer of the Scots, meaning you have to w- w- worry about naval warfare. You have to worry about terrain differences. You have to worry about hex control. Um, just to be honest, I would say if you're going to get a American Revolutionary game. I would definitely opt for We the People, which is, happens to be in my top ten games, so maybe I'm just being a little biased here. But of the block games, this is this one that I, I don't normally recommend to people. It's one of those turkeys, I guess, that me and Tom talk about. When I first got it, I was kind of enthused about it. I played it once with a good buddy named Bob and when I first got it, and Bob didn't like it right off the bat. And I was like, oh, Bob, just give it a chance, give it a chance. And I guess I was fighting for it to be a better game than it was because after I played it a few more times, I started realizing everything that Bob said was true. And he criticized the over-randomness. He criticized the, 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 the lack of reason for Fog of War. Why do you need Fog of War in an American Revolution game? I mean, for the most part, you knew where the, Ameri- where the American Army was, or the British armies were and stuff. There wasn't a real, real big need for the Fog of War. And um, there's, a, there's a one interesting system, though. You can trade um, prisoners. So if you, instead of killing things, when you, when you, kill, when you kill a, a unit, a block, you stick it off to your side of the map, and it's a prisoner. And then any time during the game, you can negotiate a prisoner trade. You can say, well, I want to be able to pick my reinforcements next turn. If I'll, I'll give you this, this guy if you say yes. Or don't attack me anywhere in New York for the whole next year, and I'll give you back this guy. So it kind of adds a neat negotiating factor, but it's kind of pointless because halfway through the game, there's no more motivation. There's no reason to trade. Why would the American player who already has the British player on the ropes do anything to help him? And the game can be very anticlimactic. I mean, once the one time I played, it came down to the last die roll, literally. But most of the times I've played, the last two turns, well, I mean, the last two years even, you kind of know that the British player can't win, and you're just kind of going through the motions. Because the British player, he has to control, I think, 30. He has to control so many victory points to do it. It's just, you really got to stretch thin. And anyway, in a nutshell, I wouldn't recommend this game. Huh, you seem to differ than most people. You know, you're... The average rating of the game is pretty high on the internet. Is it really? Yeah. Um, some people say it's a good solitaire game. Have you tried it that way? <laughs> no, actually, I've not. And I, you, the, you, to me, I can't play a solitaire game that has fog of war because it kind of takes away the point of solitaire. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. I don't, I don't know much about that sort of thing. And besides, I don't want to talk about solitaire games this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, my review is of the game that we're about to hand out as a prize. It's Sheer Panic, S-H-E-A-R, Sheer Panic. It's a game by the Lamont Brothers, uh, Fragger Games from Scotland. It's a pretty much a homemade game, independent uh, publication, but the pieces inside, most of them are pretty casual pieces, but the, the main crux of the game, which are nine sheep, are really nice looking. They look like far side sheep Christmas ornaments. Far side. Yeah, oh, they, like they the look, com- like, they oh, look the, like the sheep from the, the comic Far Side. Oh, okay, okay. And they're on their they're on the little square bases, and basically, each player who plays controls two of those sheep, or the they don't necessarily control them, but those two sheep are in their color. And as the game goes by, you on your turn you have a choice of one of twelve actions. Once you use the action, you can no longer use it for the rest of the game. Each action causes a timer 
to move a certain distance during the game, and then the action lets you move the sheep in a certain way. Depending on where the timer is on the game track, you score points. During the first fourth of the game, you score points if you are tu- if your sheep are touching in some way, both your sheep. During the, s- the second fourth of the game, you you score points if you are closest to Roger Ram, who's always in the front of the herd. So you basically want to be in the front of the herd to win his affection. In the third fourth of the game, you are trying to touch a black sheep who's in the crowd. You're playing tag with him. And then in the final round, a shearer is put in front, and this time you don't want to be in front. You don't want to be anywhere near the shearer. You want to be in the back. In fact, the shearer at two different points in the game shears the front row, which I'll say it. We just say he killed them because that just sounds cooler. And basically, that's what happens. They disappear. So he made it into a war game. <laughs> but uh, that that adds a bit of cutthroatness to the game because at the end, in one game I played, one guy managed to line up everybody's sheep on the front row but his and killed them all, and he won that way. And the game is fairly simple, although there are points in that where people could sit there and go, oh, I don't know what action to take, and they could think. But while it's simple... There's some real strategy to the game. At first, scores are pretty close because everyone's doing the same thing and and copying each other's moves. But if you make the right move at the right time, like that move where he pretty much killed everyone else's sheep but his own or they were shorn, um, it's it's very... I see some great possibilities. It's a light game with high possibilities. There is a small possibility that it could get dragged down by someone who has what we call analysis paralysis, which means it takes them forever to take their turn. But overall, I think it was really fun. It reminded me of LeapFrog, which is their first game. But LeapFrog was two-dimensional. You just jumped your frog forward or backwards. In this one, the sheep can move sideways or diagonally. And there's different rules about when sheep break off from the flock, how they connect back in. And it's kind of like a, a living uh, amoeba movement as you watch the sheep move around the table. I, I really did enjoy the game. It's, I don't know if I'd classify it as light. It made, it's a little bit heavier than light. But it looks like it's light, and it feels like it's light, but there's more strategy and depth to that. And since it's such a neat game, and since there's only, what, 500 copies of it, uh, we're now going to hand one of those out. Woohoo! All right. Joe's going to roll the, the magical dice. Now, uh, what we've done is that we've had uh, quite a few entries, and we're going to round it down to six players. We're going to round it down to six people, and then once we get into those six people, we'll round it down to two. And, and then, then the final two, Tom's going to take over. Right. Um... If remember, if you, someone else recommend your name, which happened to quite a few people, then you got more than one entry, so you have more chances then. Yeah, so here you could feasibly have many names in the top six. All right, here we go. So Joe is going to roll the six numbers of wonder. What did you just do? I didn't do anything. Oh, no. I think that was just a feedback from yeah, your microphone. You're probably right. Okay, go All ahead. Right. All right, here we go. Here's the first number. 86. 86, and that is Eric... Eric Osiowai. Osiowai, okay. Uh, I probably pronounced it wrong. I'll just call him Eric O. All right, here we go. Next one. Number 90. Number 90 is Mitch Willis. All right, number three. 61. 61 is Jeff Knox. Number four. 25. 25 is Bobby Passmore. All right. Come on, Walt. You still got two more chances. <laughs> yeah. Well, Walt actually had what three people recommend him. He has four four entries in here. All we right. haven't rolled them yet. Next one, number five. Well, that went on a keyboard. Hold on, let me roll that again. All right, number thirty-four. Number thirty-four uh, is John Burt. John Burt. Here's your last chance, Walt. Number six. <laughs> one of these days, Walt will win. Forty-one. Again. Forty-one is Mike Whitesell. All right. Now let's round that down to two. All right. Number one is Eric O. Mitch Willis is number two. Jeff Knox is number three. Bobby Passmore is number four. John Burt is number five. And Mike Whitesell is number six. And so Joe does the first roll. And it is number three, Jeff Knox. So Jeff Knox, you're in the final two. And now for our number two other one, Joe, go ahead and roll the die. And it's John Burt. So we're down to two people. Now, before we roll for the final the final contest of to see who gets this free game, we're going to go through 
and we're going to read what their top games are. I'd like to mention that as we, as I went through and looked at everyone's top games, I was really impressed with just how many people didn't um, have the same game. Right. There wasn't I mean, a bunch of uh, clones here. There's a bunch of individual thinkers. Now, John Burke gave two different games. He said of his favorite games, the game he would prefer to play if he had his choice would be Advanced Civilization, a game that John and I have yet to, to play, but I don't know if I'm ever be interested in it because I have Seven Ages, which does a Civilization game for me. The cleaner. But if he had to play one this year, then he would play Battle Cry. And I'm surprised. I, I didn't know too many people liked Battle Cry. Yeah, a lot of people like Battle Cry. I, I think it works better than some think. While Jeff Knox said that his favorite game is Blocus. Blocus. Because it plays under an hour and works sweet with two or four. He says three is kind of awkward, and I agree. Three that's is we got, awkward. That's why we got Jim Blow. <laughs> yeah, Jim Blow. Jim Blow's a new Korean game. And he says there's zero luck, one of our lunchtime favorites. And then Blocus. That would, that would bring up an interesting conversation What's sometime. That? He said it has zero luck, but I would say that the way other people play could... I guess that up. would be luck, yeah. in a way. I, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't agree with that. Well, All anyway, right. Joe's going to roll a, a six-sided die. A one through three will give it to Jeff Knox, and a four through six gives the free game to John Burt. Go ahead, Joe. And it's a number two. Jeff Knox, congratulations. You won Sheer Panic. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> All right. You know, I really do need to get that applause noise. Next time, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but listen, folks, we're not done. We now have another exciting contest. Now, this contest, I think, would be interesting. Well, I mean, not, not that the last contest wasn't interesting. Let me rephrase that. Okay. First, <laughs> first we're going to talk about the contest itself. Well, that's what Joe's talking about. He's talking, last time we asked you to name your favorite game, All which right, was so really interesting, and I don't have any data on it because everyone picked a different game. Right. I will pick some of the best answers and try to get them up on my website. Uh, now, people's reasons for why they like games. This week we're going to do just the opposite. Uh, th- not this week, but this contest. What we want to know is we want your top five least liked games or your most hated games. And um, so I think we're going to have quite a variety in this one. There's there's quite a different uh, spectrum of games that you can choose from. You can. Uh, I don't want to give any say any names because everyone's just going to copy me. So to right, <laughs> and, and and that's important because we're going to play this just like the game. What were you thinking by Richard Garfield? Uh, right. and, and what were you thinking? You're going to pick five games, and you're trying to pick games that everyone else is also picking. So, for example, let's say you say Ticket to Ride is the worst game, is how, one of the how, top how five. How did you know I was going to say that? <laughs> yeah. Let's say you say Ticket to Ride right, is, which to ride, I doubt anyone would say. And then Puerto, let's Re- say Puerto Rico, Rico let's say, Goa. Let's say 30, 30 people pick Ticket to Ride besides you. Then you would get 31 points. And whoever gets the most points is the winner. And if there's a tiebreaker... Then we'll have to roll a die off. But last time we did this, there was no tiebreaker. It was close. Yeah, but but last time we p- had them pick their ten best games from one specific year. This time we're yes, having yeah. you pick five games of all times. What you think are the five worst games, or I guess even more importantly, what you think everyone guess, else thinks is the worst five just, games. Just to make the game uh, make it a little bit easier, let's say that you can only use games that you could find in the database. Because otherwise, uh, you know, well, I mean, guess you're, like, if you want to put a bunch of obscure names that games that no one's ever heard of, I guess you you're going to lose. You're going to lose. So, I guess the contest is really is what are the top, the least five, the games that you think that everyone else think are the worst games. I guess it's not your worst games. It's what you think other people think are the worst games. Now, our prize today, or for this contest, and this contest will end in two weeks. I'll, I'll have the data done, and we'll we'll accept our last entry on October fourth. So if you don't have it in by October 4th, then that's... No, October 4th? That's next week. I'm sorry. October 11th. Right. Say, like, my wife's birthday is October the 3rd. Right. So, so if you have it week. in by October 11th, then we'll accept it. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the biggest... One of the biggest companies in America, up-and-coming companies, is Fantasy Flight Board Games. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games, they make, they make some RPG stuff, but they've recently started making... Or they, they've always made board games, but they recently have really delved into board games. Sure. And they really make some of the best-looking board games, and in my opinion, some of the best-playing board games. Their packaging's not the best. They're, well, <laughs> oh, the recent ones. Yeah. Uh, recent board games from them are Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, which is the biggest board game I own. Uh, <laughs> and it's huge. It's in my top ten games. Doom, the board game, which I think was a very accurate portrayal of the 3D computer shooting game and it was a very fun game uh, 
They've done Runebound Second Edition. They're coming out with World of Warcraft, the board game. They've done um, a whole series of small box games, including the very popular Citadels and Minotaur Lords. They did Warcraft, right? And and uh, they they did Warcraft, the board game. They've really done some good games. And one of their newest games that they've done is Beowulf. And Beowulf is a game that some people have compared to Lord of the Rings. Well, basically, let me tell you a bit about it. Uh, it's called Beowulf the Legend, and it's a competitive board game for two to five players. Players take the role of boon friends and companions to the mighty hero, Beowulf, and accompany him along his journeys and adventures. Over the course of major and minor episodes, players reenact scenes from the epic story by playing cards to overcome challenges. Traveling, friendship, wit, courage, and fighting will ensure victory in each episode, and the player who displays the most skill, audacity, and luck will earn rewards of fame and fortune. Beowulf the Legend is designed by the legendary Rainer Knizia. Never heard of him. And lavishly illustrated by John Howe, the same team that brought you the Lord of the Rings board game. And John Howe is a very, very talented artist. The Lord of the Rings board game has some tremendous art in it. And, of course, Rainer Knizia is one of the world's premier game designers. Rainer or Reiner? Reiner. I'm sorry, Rainer Knizia. If you haven't heard of him, which is quite possible, you should look him up on BoardGameGeek.com, and you'll find that he's designed many games, including many of the top-rated games, such as Tigers and Euphrates, Lord of the Rings board game, which was the first, well, one of the first games that did a cooperative game. Well, one of the first way. popular ones, right? Right. In fact, some people have compared Beowulf to Lord of the Rings and said it's kind of like Lord of the Rings in a competitive way. Other people have argued with that, and so who knows? And some people say the theme is strong. Other people say the theme is not. But either way, it's a beautiful game. It looks like it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm looking forward to playing it myself. So and we're giving away two copies. Two copies. So, so is that the first and second place? First then? and second place. And not only will the winners get a, a, a copy, they're also going to get a poster of the box art that's signed by both John Howe and Rainer Knizia. Rainer Knizia. <laughs> so you, cool. you, if you win, you get... A poster signed by the designer and the artist, and you get the game. Brand new, just came out last month or this month, I guess. You know, I've been, I've been playing a lot of cooperative games lately. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll like this game. I'm not sure because I don't really like Lord of the Rings. But it's too not much. cooperative. From what I can understand, from what I, little I've read, is that players are basically in the shadow of Beowulf and they're trying to emerge from his shadow and share in the glory of his feats. Which sounds interesting. I thought we were trying to. I thought you'd be trying to kill Beowulf. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Why, why must everything always be so evil with you? <laughs> so anyway, what is the monster's name in Barrel Wolf? Grim, Grim, Gr- Grendel. Grendel, right? Grendel. right that's Grendel. one of them. He, I think he fights more than one. That's the most famous. That's the one I did like a Star Trek episode about. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, don't forget if you're interested, email us the five worst games that you know of. Make sure you email, email us at thedicetower at gmail dot com. Or you can email me at TomVassell at gmail.com or Joe at Joe, Joe Stedman. Stedman at gmail.com. Go okay. figure. And if you need a Gmail invite, let me know. i got 100. I have 101. <laughs> because Ooh. by the time I give someone else one, I'll have another one. Yeah, they come real fast. <laughs> so I don't, know, I don't understand why people are still using Hotmail or, 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 Ju, or Juno of all things. I don't, I, just, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't hate to think bad things about them when I see their email address, but I'm like, come on, people. Yeah. Gmail is the way of the future. I, yeah, Yahoo's not too bad. I, I'm kind of a holdout for Yahoo, but man, Hotmail? Hotmail's horrible. Are we turning this into a tech show? I hope not. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Because we're not, we're, me and you do nothing with computers in our jobs. <laughs> we're not computer gurus <laughs> like bad. some other people. We, we actually, um, I'm really excited about this contest. I really would like to thank Fantasy Flight for uh, donating the games for it. Folks, these are really exciting. I mean, can we enter? Can we enter this? I guess we can't. No, but there are some really good games coming out. We got other contests coming. Got some more games coming too. I've been asking some people. People been asking me, and I got some more games coming. Don't worry. And and so enter these contests. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you lose and nothing happens. But it only takes an email, and you say your five worst games. We'll do the rest. And we'll get those games out to you. And if you don't know your five worst games, just go to uh, some web page and look on their, their list. And you can just put down things like uh, Puerto Rico and Tigers and Euphrates. <laughs> if, if you can't tell, we're being sarcastic in, go, those, uh, in that regard. All righty. Well, right. now let's get to our questions because people keep emailing them to us. All right. Well, let me re- I'll read the first one, Tom. It says, uh, 
Have you uh, have you ever heard the press about the game? Ever, he's basically saying, have you ever heard press about a game, read through the rules, read session reports, heard all the rave reviews about a game, and were absolutely thrilled about the prospect of playing this game, and then, bleh, nothing. It just totally falls flat. One of the hallmarks of these type of games is you're so stunned at the mediocrity that you refuse to pass judgment on it until you play it again and again and again, until you just give up and remain absolutely confused on what went wrong. This is from uh, Mark Aldridge. Well, I know what Joe's answer is going to be, so you might as well say it. <laughs> it is, too. Ten Joe is definitely one, and the other one is a game I reviewed today, which is Liberté. Well, with Ten Joe, I don't know if there was necessarily a lot of good press on it. I, I haven't found no, too many people who... There who, wasn't any good press on it. It was just, uh, it looked beautiful on the internet. And, that's uh, true. And when you read the rules, they really did look really good. Yeah. The pieces looked fantastic. But some of the stuff in the game, like where you could trade away family members and capture family members, it sounded it's not like really... It's cool, but in cool. reality, the game was broken. Yeah. And uh, the company went belly up. So, I mean, it, it can't be uh, that good of a game. For me, I, I can't think of any game off the top of my head that's fallen yeah, flat. Yeah, I can think of one of yours. Globalopolis or whatever that. Yeah, but again, I didn't read any great reviews on it. See, I think one of the great things is you can look on the internet and read great reviews. Are you shilling? No, <laughs> no. I mean, you can you can read a lot of reviews and, and find out a lot of information about games. And I haven't found one that's been praised by a lot of people that I didn't like. Now, Tigers and Euphrates came close. I thought I didn't like it, but once I played it again, I realized it was actually a good game. Okay, let me ask you this then, Tom. Uh, this kind of adapts this question. If you're looking to buy a game, how do you go about it? If I was looking to buy a game, it would be... Suppose you got a gift certificate from your mama for uh, 50 bucks and you want to go buy a game. What, how are you going to do it? Well, I wouldn't... I wouldn't... You're saying I have no kind of idea of what I want? Well, this is saying that you're, you're itching to buy a new game. So how, well, how would you go about doing that? Well, this guy, you know, because he says read, he says read reviews. I mean, so if you were going to read reviews, I'm not trying to shill yourself, but I mean, okay, discounting Tom Vassell's vast number of reviews, what, what, what would you do? Would you go to like someone else's? I, reviews? I would, would go to go? BoardGameGeek.com and I would look at their their top 100 ranked games to see and, what you did. Then I would read the reviews on each one of those games that sounded interesting to me. If it doesn't sound interesting to you, then you probably shouldn't even try it. I think. Unless you're totally bowled over, but pick ones that are interesting, then read the reviews. I don't. I, I guess I have the the fast food way. I just go to the uh, comments, the user comments, and then I can almost always tell just by looking at the user comments if I'm going to like a game or not. Well, I apologize. I I think I mean I consider those comments reviews of the game. They're very very many many reviews. But yes, I always go and I always look at the people who love the game, and I want to know why do they love it. Yeah. The people who rate it nines and tens, and then I go look at the people who hated the game. And see why did they hate it? Uh-huh. The mediocre people don't usually do a lot for me. I usually want to see why people hated it or why they loved it. Sometimes I'll go to Consim and I'll go to the manufacturer. If it's a war game, I'll go to Consim and I'll just I'll go to the manufacturer's page in Consim who makes the game and just put a flame up like this game sucks and then see how many people reply. And you know, if a lot of people reply defending it, it's probably a good game. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark Aldrich. The next question is from Jeff Spear. And this is for Joe. He says, I have limited war game experience, but I've picked up a few war games. Sword of Rome, Paths of Glory, Crusader Rex. Uh, what's the best way to teach one of these games when I haven't played it myself? Ooh. Well, they, I, guess, I guess I can't get around play, talking about what I don't want to talk about tonight, which is playing solitaire. <laughs> I guess the best way to do it, and with a, with a card-driven game, like okay, Sword of Rome, you can't really play it by yourself because it's a four-player game. But Pog, you know, Pog, you can play it. You can play Paths of Glory by yourself at least through a few turns. And didn't you do that once yourself, Tom? Did you not? How? Me and you play Paths of Glory. Yeah, what what Joe and I did when we first were learning Paths of Glory, and this is, I, I I don't mean to butt in on Joe's question, but this is how I would teach a game that a complicated game that I don't know. For Slowly example, and steadily, I mean. Revolution, the Dutch Revolt. I'm going to play with Joe eventually. Uh-huh. And we just sit it down and we go through one step at a time. Together. Because he's pretty patient about it and I'm pretty patient and so we'll just go through it. Right. If the person you're playing with isn't patient, then you're going to have to sit down and go through it ahead of time yourself. Yeah. And or another good thing, like uh, if you can go to one of the online sites that people play real time, then that's like that's how I'm learning ASL. I go to uh, the Vassal and I just play there all the time. And Vassal is a internet site that I have a link to on my blog where you can go and play many games, not just ASL, but you can go and play live. And you find people there willing to teach all the time. So you find someone who's just willing to teach. And that's the best way to learn a game is to have someone sit down and show you. I mean, but if you can't do that, then yeah, just slowly and surely work your way through the rules, bite-sized pieces, and 
you know. Most games, uh, and I guess because they're not as complicated as Joe's War Games, but most games I can read the rules and pretty much visualize in my head how the game works. But every, I'd say maybe every ten games, I have to sit the game out, put the pieces down, and watch it play for me to see how those rules apply to the game mechanics. You know, war games are very similar. I mean, most war games, you look at the nuts and bolts of the game engine. How does the game work? What is the combat system? And once you do that, once you learn a basic player sequence, and you look at a few examples of play, then you just kind of slowly go through and you add rules, and you figure out, oh, well, I guess we did this wrong. And you just kind of go, you know, it's not that bad. And usually, don't don't... Don't judge a game the first time you play it because you're guaranteed to play half the rules wrong, at least in my experience. All right. Our next, we have two questions from Kimbo, one for Joe and one for me. His question for Joe says, have you played the Avalon Hill card game Gorilla? And if so, what is your opinion of the game? You know, I have played it. When I first read it, I had forgotten, but I had played Gorilla. I played it before. It's like the manly version of Bang. Now, I know that's kind of funny to say. It's a multiple-player card game, and it's similar to Upfront, um, and it's great for five people. Um, basically, two people can play the, the good forces, and one person's going to play the, the neutral or a mercenary. Or you can play, you can or two people play the, the enemy. When it, basically, it's a, it's it's a multiple multiplayer card game that's uh, a war game, and it's very similar to it's like a combination of upfront and bang. And I, I think it's one of those overrated or those underlooked overlooked games. I'm sorry, it's one of those overlooked games that came out in the 90s before Avalon Hill went uh, bankrupt there, or not bankrupt, but once before Avalon Hill sold out. Uh, that gets overlooked, and actually, I, I'm looking for a copy right now. I'd like to get a copy. And then they, but I would want to tell you this: if you didn't know this, Kimbo, uh, the designer of the game, he redid the game in a much more streamlined and uh, better format. And it's called uh, Combat Soldiers: uh, The Battle of the Bulge, or Combat Combat Soldiers and the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, look it up. It's Lost Battalion Games, LBG Games. Uh, his name's Neil Schaffler, uh, Schaffler, Schaffler, something like that. You know, he redid the game. It's basically Guerrilla, but it's set in World War II, and this is the one I'd recommend that you pick up if you don't know this already. All right. All right. Tom's question said, uh, now uh, that Louis the Fourteenth has won the Duchess she Pierre, whatever, what is that? The Dutch, the Dutch Guild de Jour? Is that what it is? Basically, it's 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 a award in Germany. That's given out to. It's given out almost by popular vote. You get on the internet and vote for your favorite game. So it's not the Spiel des Jours. It's something else. Right. It's more of a. It's, it's kind of like German. the Golden Globes. Okay. Compared to the. So anyway, now that the game has won this award, do you question your initial opinion of the game? Will you go back to see if there's more to it than you initially thought? And he means because both Tom and I, we kind of said cross things about the game. We, I don't know how. You know, go ahead, Tom. What's your thoughts? I, I, I play so many games that. A game that I don't own, and I don't own Louis the Fourteenth, would be hard for me to go out of my way to play it again and try it out. I actually felt that I had a pretty good grasp of how the game worked after we played, and then we talked sure. about it for a while. And I could go back and play it again with different strategies. I, don't stuff. Know, I think we, I think we completely understood the game. I just, I, for me at least, it was just kind of dry. It just wasn't, it wasn't fun. I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, a lot, I make fun of Euro games all the time, but a lot of the Euro games are fun. I mean, it's kind of fun because of the different mechanics or whatever. But this game, I just didn't find it fun. I walked away thinking, wow, that was an exercise of and there's this, nothing. there's this shield draw in it where you, 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 you're drawing shields during the game, and then you turn them over at the end, and you get points from having ones that match. It was just such a random yeah, because thing I remember, added to such a practical that, game. Yeah, it was weird because it was like the whole game, it's, it's not a short game. We're playing this game, playing this game, playing, and I think I'm totally out of it. And I, I thought I was Tom was like, oh, he's like trouncing everybody. He's all cocky. He's like, yeah, I won. And I thought, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I didn't really care. We flipped over the shields, and I won. <laughs> and it was like, how many people playing that day? Four? Five. Yeah, Five. four of us. Four of us. And uh, I won, and I had no clue. And and there is a lot of neat tactical things in the game. It just didn't come together. It wasn't fun. It was interesting, but it wasn't fun. And I'm sorry, Kimbo, this must be one of your favorite games, because you've asked us about this twice now. Did he? Yeah, so, sorry, Kimmy. <laughs> no, in fact, I, I do predict that this same game might win the International Gamers Awards, which are going to be announced soon. Um, I'm not sure it will win. My my money is on Cathedral. I, I really think Cathedral's going to do it, but we'll see. We talked I, about this last I think this one or two shows ago. A dark horse chance. All right. Another question for me from Hans Kischel. It says, uh, Tom, what kind of dice do you like? What kinds of what colors are your favorites? How many do you have? It was something like a pet. Uh, if somewhere send, uh, if you were to send you, uh, if someone were, were going to send you dice, what would you want them to send you? What, do you like dice with the pips or the numbers? Okay. Well, the last one's easy. 
I like tips much better than numbers. Really? I like numbers. Although, well, I, okay, I guess I like six-sided dice with pips. Okay. But after that, I want numbers because... <laughs> <laughs> you got 20 <laughs> pips. Oh, but no. with a six-sided die, I just got so used to reading numbers. Even now, I'm trying to teach my daughter just to, the at, at a glance... You got, you got so used to reading the pips. To, to, to look at pips and know it's a three, four, five. Um, a better question, I think, would be what kind of dice do I prefer? Chessex. I prefer the real small... Yeah, Chessex is probably my favorite. I prefer the smaller, smallish ones. They're maybe uh, the ASL dice. a little bit less than a centimeter. No, maybe half a centimeter. I, I don't remember the exact measurement. Half a centimeter. But they, I like the ones with rounded edges. I do not like hard corners. I know hard corners stop rolling faster, but I like the so rounded you, edges. You like the 40K dice. Yes, I like the ones that they come with they're the, the same, 40K. Right, they're the same size as your basic Avalon Hill dice. In all the old Avalon Hill games, but they got rounded corners. I uh, prefer light dice with dark pips, or yeah, and that, that's what my favorite color is. As to how many dice I have, I have thousands. Yeah, he I, does. I have a whole drawer of dice, not to mention all the dice that are in all my games. I have, uh, I just have one of those like Plano fig, uh, fishing uh, tackle box things, the, the clear plastic ones, full of dice, and I've got mostly minor ASL dice. And so if someone comes to my house to play ASL, I'll let them choose their own set. I, I do not. I do not like. Well, I'm sorry. I I do like the cubes of dice that you can get from Chessex, where you can get a whole bunch from the same color. Dice I do not like are dice that are color blind. Oh man, there are problems some, where you have there are green dice really with red ones. numbers on, and you know the. the uh, so I got a hundred sided die. I do very dearly love dice. I'm going to design a game about dice someday. But there's so many games about dice already. Right. Dice was that one dice? What's yeah, that? but I I have ideas, but I I can't I can't share them with the world yet. All oh, right, okay. All right, next question. Okay, from Wes Osborne, he wanted us to go through a live performance of introducing <laughs> someone to a new game. So we're going to do that. Why, why does he want us to do this? Because he's constantly teaching people new games. Uh, okay, well, let me go. Let me, let me show you how I would teach Tom. All okay, right. Joe's gonna be teacher, and I'm gonna be the guy who doesn't play war games. Okay. All right, I said, so, hey, Joe, what's up? Hey, man, I want to show you this new game, dude. Oh. It's called ASL. Well, that sounds fun. Yeah. All right. All right. Is, so, is, is it like Risk? Yeah. It, no. Okay. Anyway, anyway, okay. shut up. Let's listen. All okay. Right. Basically, we're going to do a real easy scenario. So let's get like five or six tanks. We'll do Japanese and caves, and uh, we'll do paratroopers. Uh, all right, and, oh, glider, okay. and gliders. All okay. right. And um, let me hold on. I think hold on. Let me look up the rule. Just sit there and act act like you're enjoying yourself while I look up these rules. Are there, are there miniatures? Uh, no, only in deluxe ASL, which I don't have because you know because there's like let me let me show you like there's like 15 different boxes of ASL and oh. rules and uh, but it's not that hard. It's really simple. Uh, do you want to go to the movies? <laughs> No, that was that, actually that was a joke. We don't. I wouldn't really teach ASL that way. Yeah. Otherwise, they would have nobody learning the game. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Tom. Do it. Right, okay, you Joe, do, I'll, I'll be the dummy this time. All right. Hey, Joe, I got this new game. You really? Want, you want to try it out? What's new? Well, <laughs> hey, well, no, seriously, this is a game I think you really like. It's called Ticket to Ride. Really, Ticket to Ride? Huh? Is that not a Beatles song? Yeah, uh, it, it, and it's and it, when you play the song, it reminds you of it. Not really, but it, it's really fun. And 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 you, I know you're the kind of guy who likes competition, and this game has a bit of that in it. Okay, cool. All right, so what we're gonna do is, in, and at this point in time, parentheses, I'm setting the board up, and I'm showing all the cards, and I'm setting it up, and I'm I'm saying, okay, now don't be confused by all the different colors. Everything is really very and, simple. And I'm looking at it going. Uh, trains. Uh. <laughs> then it's very simple. On your turn, you're going to have a choice between three different things. Oh, this is like Monopoly. Well, kind of like Monopoly, except it's without the dice, the board, and any of the other stuff that comes with Monopoly. <laughs> How many times have I heard that? Oh, it's like Monopoly. But I'll say, well, it's it's similar to Monopoly in that we there's cards in your hand. But other than that, there's really no communications. This is a game I think is better than Monopoly <gasps> because you actually don't roll dice to determine your move. You're going to actually determine what you do each turn. But there's so many. Look at how thick, I don't understand. Look, how, look at that rule book. I mean, the rules the, the games actually, I'm used to are on the back of the, actually, the box. With, with, if you flip over the box, usually the rules are printed right on the lid. Well, let me parentheses here. Is when I'm teaching new people a game, I almost never even show them the rules. <laughs> uh, I, just, I, I just start the game off. And I say, okay, Joe, on your turn you have different things that you can do. You can take two cards here. You can either take two of the ones that are face up, or you can take one from the face down pile. Now, this locomotive card is a wild card. It's 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 better but, okay, than the rest. And that counts. What's the point cards. of the game? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do here. The point of the game is to get the most points, and you're going to get that in two different ways: by connecting cities that are yours, or by 
putting different trains on the board. When you put trains on the board, you get points. So it just the most points wins? The most points wins at the end hmm. of the game. That seems simple. It is simple. And let me show you. And at this point, I would can do we, some things, and I would show them how to play. I'd say if you play three red cards. And I almost always visualize it. I'll show something. Can I kill stuff? <laughs> at this point, I punch Joe for a while and say no. <laughs> All right, so you get the picture. I mean, But I, I always... After playing a game one or two times, you realize what people have a problem with. For example, in Ticket to Ride, some people have confusion that there's red train cards and then there's someone who has red trains. And in the game, they're not correlated at all. Mm -hmm. But I know that's a confusion problem, so I always make sure that I, I bring it up to people. I'll say, hey, these aren't the same as this. It's not a big deal, just so you understand that. And I explain everything I think will be a problem in as clear language. I pretend that I'm teaching to 10-year-olds, but I don't use a language for 10-year-olds. I use it as if I'm talking to adults. With, uh, now, in the serious side of, of teaching a war game, I just, I, basically what I do is I try to find out what have they played. Because with me, it's just drawing comparisons for war games. Because war games, there's really not that much uniqueness. So it's either like this game or like that game. And so I just try to think, well, oh, have you played this? Have you played that? And once I find a game that they have played, and then I say, well, it's just like this game, except for we're not going to do this, we're going to do that. And the combat system is slightly different, and then that's it. Well, Joe has a point there, because once I teach the opening game, Ticket to Ride, or Set was a right, Con, bridge game, or Carcassonne, opening game, right. then I'll say, hey, this is just like Carcassonne, except... We add this and this and, and this. It's just like tickets. And Tom and I are, are we're, we're really crack dealers. Because <laughs> really, when I introduce people to wargaming for the first time, I always teach them one or two games. It's always the same game. I know the rules like the back of my hand, and I'm never gonna. I'm, I don't have to think any rule book, and I know exactly how to teach them. There should be. You should have. It should be almost like. Uh, you should have one or two games memorized that you can teach efficiently, and so you don't stumble over the rules and turn them off at a game. I'm right. not as good as. That perhaps because I always have this pile of games that must be played because they're new, and so <laughs> sometimes I'll bring a game out which does bomb dreadfully. Then I feel horrible, right. and then I quick pull my old standby. Oh well, Ticket to Ride is here. <laughs> Let's try that. Uh -huh. And so, um, so cool. Wes, I'm sorry we can't do the whole thing for you, um, but if you ever come to Korea, I'll teach you how to play a game. <laughs> All right. So, so those are our questions. Cool. If you have questions, you can send them to us. Uh, go to thedicetower.com and. Send us email there. The email is the dice yeah, you, can, you can find all our emails at that site. Right. Okay. And then, uh, so what, what, what games have we played this week, Tom? I mean, I, I know once again I played ASL, but I've been playing ASL religiously now for the past two months. So that doesn't, turn into the, that doesn't really count. I'm Tom not, is I, Euro games I, I, and Joe is ASL. I, I had a couple, I've had three people email me and say, please don't turn us into the ASL show. Well, I won't. Don't worry. I'll, I'll keep my addiction at home. Don't worry. I'm still playing plenty of other games. I got plenty of time. Actually, we played a game together with my uh, board game club, HeroScape. Yeah, that's, it was fun. Very, very light. Very, very fun. But for <laughs> people who think it's too light, Joe Joe played against the uh, the kids, and I kind of refereed to a degree. Yeah, it was me 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 versus a bunch of bunch of junior high boys, and they were just like mobbing across the board, and I was actually using strategy. Right, and tactics does work. Yes, there's luck, and yes, there was some. Lucky shots, and sometimes Joe's stuff died and all. But overall, he won because he just played better. And, it, I, and it, I think the game is a, a pre-war war game. Yeah. I, do you think so? I think so. It, it, it's great. It's a fun game. I, if I saw I'd pick it up. I just I wouldn't want to pay for the shipping. But I would if I was, if I, if I was at Toys R Us or a discount store somewhere and I, I saw I would definitely pick up a copy. Yeah, just, I don't want to blow my thunder onto when, when, when we get together and do a, a top ten mass market games uh, or games that you can find at Toys R Us. We're going to do that sooner or later. Uh, I don't want to tell you what my number one game is, but Heroescape is really fun. <laughs> yeah, Heroescape is, is it's, it's, yeah, because it's, it was funny because they, they were moving all their, their pieces, all these different pieces across the board in this big blob, and I had this big dragon, and I just kind of like waited and waited and waited, and they're, they're kind of like, what is he doing? And all of a sudden, my dragon just dropped down on top of him and flamed them all. <laughs> and for, for those of you who don't know anything about Heroescape, basically it's a, it looks like a miniatures game. It looks like a collectible miniatures game. It's not. They're pre-painted miniatures. And the the theme has something to do with people from all over history. Are it's in that the combat. theme is time pirates, <laughs> right? And it's really cool because I have revolutionary colonial Minutemen and versus a, a dragon versus the Men in Black versus werewolves, a squad of World War II American soldiers, and, and versus knights from King Arthur's table. And it's versus elves. <laughs> to me, that's that's fascinating. To the kids, it's fascinating. 
Um, with each, they come out with expansions, but you see what you're getting, so you can buy just the stuff you want. And they got hot lava death. Right. <laughs> and so I, I highly, highly recommend this, especially if you have kids. And the boys love this game. The terrain is really, the terrain is really cool too, from a miniatures point of view. It's. it's I've never had a game go over as well as, as with, with boys as Heroes Gate. Yeah, I'd recommend it. Uh, also, this week I played the evil game Intrigue uh, three times. Uh, I read a lot of negative things about it. Basically, the game encourages backstabbing. You have to backstab. There's no way around backstabbing in the game. And that, you know, I guess with certain groups, that would be a horrible, horrible thing. But with the, I played it twice with teenagers, and I played it once with uh, a bunch of adults, all who had good attitudes, and I had a good time all three times. But it is evil, and I definitely would not play it with someone who could not walk away from the table, leaving everything at the table. Speaking of games I don't get to play much, I played uh, Axis and Allies Pacific on uh, Sunday with a couple of soldiers, and um, and I, I posted some comments about that on my blog, but I, I still think that As- Access and Allies Pacific is definitely the best of the five. There's five versions of Access and Allies now, in case you didn't know. There's the original Access and Allies, there's the, revi- the revised version of Access and Allies, there's the Access and Allies Pacific, Access and Allies Europe, and Access and Allies D-Day. And uh, I'm pretty sure that there's plans for an Access and Allies Guadalcanal, right? An Access and Allies, yada, yada. But anyway, uh, I played it, and it's the best by far of the three. And I, I really like it. It's, it's really light, it's Access and Allies, but there's a lot of strategy. I think there's one unstoppable formula that you can use as a Japanese, but I tend not to use that because I try to have more fun with it. Right. I also got a chance to play Sheer Panic and Link, but I've already talked about Sheer Panic, and I'll talk about Link in just a second. All right. Well, good. So let's go on. Let's move on to our uh, player categories. Yeah, each show we talk about player categories. We hate to generalize, but we we do it in just this one section. But some people are four or five of these categories. Some people are just one. Um, and well, yeah. You know, it's when you play people, even strangers, you can immediately label them as one of these categories, usually. Right. And you, we give you the category, and you so when think, they get, when oh, yeah, that's a so-and-so. Or maybe worse, you think, it's me. <laughs> so if someone gets mad at you, you can say, just blame Tom. Tom Vassal, it's his fault. For, for me this week, mine is the pessimist. This is the kind of person that from the moment the box hits the table, they tell you not only are they going to lose, but they're going to play the worst game anyone has ever played, ever. Oh, this isn't my kind of game. I'm so horrible at these games. And they moan the whole game. And you know what? A lot of times they win. And at which point you feel like giving them a nice crown of the box around their neck. <laughs> but they sit there and they're, oh, this is, oh, I'm just horrible at these blind See, this, bidding games. This is how we're and different, Tom. You, you'll, you'll try to appease them and you'll be like, oh, you'll try to, and I'll slam them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're going down faster. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the pessimist. That's my player category. All right. See, Tom, you never come up with catchy titles. You know? Yeah, I'm sorry. you got to think about that. How about Gloom and Doom? The Gloom and Doom. That's better. That's really good. Uh, mine this week is called FX. FX stands for the special effects. This is the sound effects guy. This is the guy that when you're playing a game, the war games especially, he's the guy who's always like, all right, I'm going to attack you here. You know, like the whole game, he's you know making sound effects or, you know, whatever. And if you're, at first it's kind of cute, but eventually you're just like, shut up. <laughs> Unless you're playing Mag Blast, right? Right, Mag Blast, the rule is, Mag Blast is a fantasy flight game, and the rule is you actually have to make the sound effects, otherwise your laser guns don't work. <laughs> but uh, I remember I was playing uh, 40K one time, Warhammer 40K, with a guy named Brian, and I had this other guy over that's got these eloquently painted models, and we're ta- after the game's over, we're talking, and all of a sudden we hear, boom, boom, bah, and Brian's over there with one of his models pushing and kicking over this other guy's models, like he's like a little like live-action game here, and the other guy's like, what are you doing? Because <laughs> these miniatures are very uh, hard to paint, and they're expensive, but anyway, so Brian's an FX man. Yeah, I, I thought about this. I was playing Sheer Panic, and I was moving the, the shearer around, and... So when he moved, that was I, I just moved him, not just pick him up and place him from one spot to the other, but I went, do, 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 and he moved him around. <laughs> and the other guy FX. said, you know, that made the game so much better because you did that. So I <laughs> shut up and stopped doing it. <laughs> so those are our two player categories. The FX. That music means time for our kangaroos. Our kangaroos are games that we liked. When we first played them, but we like them better now. They, they kind of jump. Yeah, they just kind of jump up. You know, at first it's okay, but then you can just grow on you. And if you're wondering where the name came from, it's from Joe, Joey. Yeah, my Reddit. son. Right. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. 
All right, Joe. <laughs> I'll go first. My uh, my my kangaroo this week is a game called Colossal Arena. Colossal Arena is a remake of Titan Arena. Um, it's uh, the first couple of times I played it, uh, so-so. I didn't know if I liked it. But I played it a few times, especially with three players. It really is a great game. Um, it basically, you just take th- you have it's like a stadium or like a, a coliseum, and you have different monsters fighting each other, and you're just a spectator, but you're you're bidding on different monsters, and then you can kind of play cards on each monster to help them or to hurt them to make it through the the grudge match. It kind of reminds me of like an old John Claude Van Damme movie, you know, we have the guys fighting, last man standing wins. Well, you know, that's what it is, but it's it's really fun. And I, I, for me, I, it's more of an influence. You're trying to influence who wins. Uh, but I I agree. If you if you listen to our show last week, it was my number one three player game. Really, really, that's right. All right. What about you, Tom? Mine is Link. And Link was actually the subject of Knuckle Bones, which is a paper magazine. It was their first big interview. They I mean review. They had several people review it, and some people gave it positive, some people gave it negative. I really like the game. Basically, Link is where one person, the two people have words, and the Four other people do not have those words, and you give one word clue to what the word in your card is. If you don't have a word in your card, you're just making up some one word clue out of the blue. And then you have to look at the words everyone gives and try and guess which two people have the same word. It's a lot of fun. When yeah. we first played it, Joe almost broke the game because we played <laughs> a rule wrong. But what happened on Sunday was pretty funny because I gave a card to everybody, and we all gave one word clues. And the clues were like blue and aqua and so, okay. water. But what were the actual words? Well, we sat there, and we, we couldn't figure it out. And everyone just guessed. We turned over our cards, and no one had words. Oh, you all had blanks? I gave everyone a blank. And so <laughs> everyone just so stared at me and said, this is the greatest game ever, Tom. Thanks. So, there's, so, <laughs> so I it was you, my I, mistake. I kind of missed it when, you're listen, when I was listening to you. So there's two, two cards that have a similar word on it. Right. And the word might be, for example, um, run. And then everyone else has a dummy card that just blank. Yes, so let's say my word is run. I would say home. And Joe might say... And and, and I have a dummy card, so I have no idea. And I would say blue. Blue, right. And then maybe the other guy who had run would say walk. And then I would say, well, he said walk. That's close to run. And I'm trying to guess who my partner is. While Joe's looking and saying, nothing correlates, so he just guesses. And then you have to give... There's two rounds. You can guess in the first round, which gets you more points, or the second round. It, it's not a laugh, laugh, laugh party game. It's kind of a party game where you sit there and you think hard, and you uh, and then once everyone guesses and it's revealed, then the laughing and the arguing, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, I can't believe you didn't guess that. my word. I remember that because the first time we played, I didn't. We had read the rule wrong, and I was just, I had, the, I had the word run, and I would say something totally wrong, like television, and then so that no one would assume it was me, but I could there carefully listen to see who had the other run. Right, <laughs> right. but you're, you and your partner both have to get it right, or you get no right. points. Cool. So those are our kangaroos, and thanks for listening to them. But we're not done yet, because now is the biggest and the best part of our show. And that is our top ten list of the week. All right. This week, our top ten game mechanics. Now, Joe said this was a hard one for him. It was a it was a, it was a hard list for me, you know. Actually, I was thinking about that little song that you had there. My wife suggested we should do the Sesame Street countdown next time. I think that'd be really cool. One ha ha ha. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, this was a very hard list for me to do uh, at first, but then when I actually started thinking about it, I realized there was a lot of game mechanics that I did like. Uh, this is kind of a weird list because the the games on my list and Tom's list are all over the spectrum of the games of, that we like and whatever. But yeah, I, I went through. I have hundreds and hundreds of games in my collection, and I have played hundreds more beyond that. And I went through and thought of, I mean, just scores and scores of game mechanics that I really like. And then I cut those down to like 20, and it was really hard for me to cut it down to 10. And even now, I'm not absolutely sure I I cut out the right 10. You know? well, one, 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 the, let me give you one disclaimer, too. that We've also both agreed that we weren't really going to do combat systems as one of our mechanics, because we could do a whole list just on combat systems, I think. Yeah, one of mine is a combat system, but when when I talk about it, uh, it's not. Ne- we'll, we'll we'll see when we get to it. Okay. Do you want me to go first? Or you want to go first this week? I'll go first. Uh, my number ten, and this is for game mechanics, is the bribing of the canal overseer in Santiago. And nor- most of my mechanics here, I can talk about several games that they're in, but this is the only one I know of. Basically, one player gets to choose where they place a canal. And that canal will water the plantations. And you desperately need water or else your plantations dry up. And the person who places the canal is offered bribes by everybody, and they show him where they want him to place the canal. 
and that's such a great part of that game. In fact, if it wasn't in the game, I'm not sure I would even like Santiago. Santiago is made by that one mechanic. Really? Everyone's sitting there, and Joe can bribe me to place my canal one way, and then his wife can add money to his bribe because she likes the way the canal's going. And then another player says, no, I want you to go this way. And I say, well, I'll go the different way. <laughs> you know? hmm. And so it's, it's really fun. And sometimes people will bribe you to place it in a place that doesn't even help anybody. It just hurts one person, and they think that's fun. And so for me, my number 10 mechanic is the bribing of the canal overseer in Santiago. Cool. My number 10 is um, from the game Formula Day. Uh, Formula Day is a race car game where it simulates the, the, the formula racing. Not the NASCAR, but the formula. Anyway, in that game, they have different dice that represent different gears. And you can uh, go up and shift down or shift up, but you roll the, the corresponding die to the corresponding gear you're in. And to me, that's just really cool because if you're going, if you're like in first gear, you're, you're, you have a three-sided die, so you're not going to go very, you know, the most spots you can move is three. But as you shift up and up and up, if you get into fifth gear as a 20-sided die, no, 30, I can't remember. It's a huge. Fifth gear is 20, sixth gear is 30. Yeah, sixth gear, 30 sided die. So when you roll that baby, you're going to move fast. The only right. problem it's, is you can roll, roll really fast into a corner and die. <laughs> yeah, it's not a 30 sided die. It's like it, it's a 30 sided die, but the numbers on it yeah, the only pips, go from 20 right. to 30. The, the pips don't correspond actually. It's it's they're they're dice that are made specifically for the game, and so you can't just go grab any old dice and use them. But I really like that mechanic. It really makes the game. I agree with Joe that this one almost made my my top ten. Really, I. I really like using a different die for different gears because when you're going really fast, you can't stop on, on a dime. And, it, and the game really does a good job of that. Yes, it's random, but it's fun. Unless, of course, you're in a tournament. <laughs> we'll tell you that story another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My number nine mechanic is the blind bidding in E's. Uh, it's spelled Y-S. Um, I like blind bidding as a whole. Some people like it, some people don't. I like Fist of Dragon Stones. I like Aladdin's Dragons. They have blind bidding in them where you make a bid, but no one knows what you bid. YS did the best way of doing that because in YS you could put your bids, which were on these little cylinders, one through four, you could put them down in different areas. So people saw where you were bidding, and in fact, some of your bids were even face up. You had to put, like I think, a little bit less than half your bids face up. Um, and so you saw some of the bids, but you didn't see all of them. And the game just really meshed well. I really like YS, or E's, however it's pronounced. It's a really good game, blind bidding game. That's my number nine. That's a weird title, though. <laughs> all right. My number nine is the, uh, there's a game called Atlantic Storm. Atlantic Storm's a, uh, Avalon Hill game from the 1990s, one of my favorite games. Anyway, th- there's something in that game called Fated Cards. And basically, this is a trick-taking game, and you play different cards that represent different uh, aspect, different naval warfare things, but there's cards that are fated, meaning that if you play the Bismarck card, for instance, or, I'm sorry, if you play like the Hood, for instance, like a, a, the British battleship Hood, and you're trying to win the trick with this powerful battleship, I have the Bismarck card, and if I play the Bismarck card, it's fated to the Hood, so I immediately get to pick up your card and stick it to my victory point pile and it's it's something that you can never count on what's going to happen and, and it's it's just it's it's really cool oh so the bismarck sank the hood yeah huh we'll see how but then the bismarck was later sank by who sank the bismarck the not the the um the Ro- arc royal i think it's arc royal and bismarck's also a faded card so if yeah you have there's the a lot of arc royal you and, can kill so you, and the thing is you, when you look at your cards they have red text on them if they're fated so you know there's a possibility that someone else is holding that card out there, so you, it's kind of a risk, risky thing, you know. So, it, but it really adds to the game and it makes the game much more fun. And I really like that aspect. This, uh, the faded cards in Atlantic Storm. My number eight game is a game is the fact that in high society, which is a light filler by Reiner Knizia, everyone's bidding on different different things during the game with money. You each have different money, and you're bidding on them with your money, trying to get these items. Whoever gets the most items. Wins the, wins the game and whoever has the most points, basically. But there's one thing about high society I like, and that's that at the end of the game, whoever has the lowest the money, or the, the least money in their hands, loses. It doesn't matter if they have the most points. If you have the <laughs> least money, you lose. And to me, that's really fun because the whole game, people are thinking about that. You don't want to bid too high because you might have the least money. I like games that have a sudden victory condition. Liberté is another one where you can win even if you're not winning the whole game overall right, by doing something else. Victory, right? And high society is the same way. You might not get the most points, but I'm surprised you didn't might make have the most list. money. I'm surprised Liberté didn't make it. It was really close. And it was the same mechanic as this in a sense, so that's why I picked high society 
where the lowest money loses. That's my number eight favorite mechanic. All right. Number eight for me is uh, an old SPI game called Battle for Germany. And uh, in Battle for Germany, there's the aspect of the game I have not seen very often, and that is that the, the two players share the Germans. In other words, uh, one player plays the German player from the west side and the American player from the... I mean, the allied player from the east side, and then the opposite, the other player plays the east German player and the western ally. And so it's really interesting because you're, it's, it's just, it's just to me, it just boggles the mind because we're both playing the Germans, and so, <laughs> but we're both trying to capture Berlin. So it just, I just like that. It was really clever, and I just like that aspect of the game. That does sound interesting. So that's your number eight. My yeah. number seven is. And for this, for me, it was hard to pick a, a single game, but I like revealing tiles. I like moving on the board and revealing tiles. And Lost Valley was one of my favorite because Lost Valley, you move your perspective along, and you turn over a tile, and maybe it was woods, or maybe it was a a river with uh, gold in it, or maybe it was a mine, and or maybe it was uh, an animal that you could hunt, and you never knew what was going to be over on the tile that you turned over. And to me, that's interesting. Now, some games I don't like that, like Goldland, but with uh, Lost Valley, it was really fun. It really gave a sense of exploration to the game. I really enjoyed Lost Valley. And that revealing tiles mechanic, that's my number seven. Hmm. All right. My number seven is the Continental Congress from We the People. Now, We the People's uh, another Avalon Hill game that's, uh, re- that talks about the American Revolution. And in this is just the American player has a little Liberty Bell that they stick uh, in a city. And... They can move that if it ever gets captured, but it starts off in Philadelphia. And if it, if, it's, if the British player ever touches the Liberty Bell, basically that whole rest of that turn, the American player is not allowed to play any operational cards. And so if it happens early, you always got to protect. So it, it kind of keeps the Americans on the ropes because they always got to watch out to have that, that Liberty Bell safe. Because if, if and it's happened to me before, like on the very first turn of a the very first card of a turn, and a turn usually I think is seven cards, uh, and, and the British player will capture the Liberty Bell. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll not notice a certain route that he can take, and it really ticks me off because then for all those cards in my hand that got all that great special text on them, and all those cards in my hand that have the uh, operations on them, I can't do them. I just got to sit there and look at them. And it just really irritates me. So I like that part of the game. So you like the part of the game that irritates you? I do because it <laughs> burns. All right. My number six is the special votes from Demo Crazy. Demo Crazy is a game that isn't very highly ranked. I really like it, though. It's one of the best games I've found for teaching my kids uh, voting principles, um, even though some of them, are, I guess, are unethical voting principles. But <laughs> you, you, you all vote on different things, on how many points something's worth or do all the guys in the room get a point or whatever. But each player has three special vote cards, a resounding yes, a resounding no, or a change. Uh, A resounding yes means if they vote yes, it doesn't matter what everyone else voted, that yes automatically wins. That was emphatic. Emphatic yes. Or if someone plays an emphatic no, no matter if, even if everyone else voted yes, the no still wins. And the change changes, if, if it was yes, it changes it to no. Now, you have to know when to play these cards. When do you save them for? Because what if you play your emphatic yes when the opponent plays his emphatic no, then they cancel each other out. Or if I play my emphatic yes and then my opponent plays the change, well, then that changes my emphatic yes to an emphatic no. <laughs> so knowing when to play these cards is a really important deal. You know, everyone's trying to hold them off to the important vote, and an important vote comes up and everyone plays them at the same time, and they all cancel each other out. And I really like that part of Demo Crazy. If you haven't played Demo Crazy, you really should give it a try. That's my number six. Cool. My number six is from the Game of Thrones. The Game of Thrones is a fantasy flight game. Um, it's, it's really fun. It's reminiscent of diplomacy, but much simpler. Um, anyway, they have some different things. There's some really cool things in the game, but the thing I just want to talk about is the, there's a little there's these little cardboard things that uh, one's a crow and one is a sword and one is the, the actual throne. But uh, there's one as a crow, and it's, it's just really cool because whoever controls the crow automatically gets to pre-look at one of their um, one of their future orders. Um, for instance, well, everyone turns um, their orders. Yeah, everyone, over. everyone turns your orders over, and then you can take and change one of your orders, and it's really a big deal in some circumstances. And I really like that. It's just cool how you can like go and change your thing after it. So there's competition. I, I just like the crow. It's cool. Yeah, that is a that is a good mechanic of that game, and the fact that the crow seems to be not worth that much, really. But yeah, it's that one often aspect, over, overlooked. In that one aspect, it's really powerful. With new, with new players, I'm almost always assured to get the crow because no one really thinks it's that powerful, but I always get it. Well, unless he's playing with me. Right, then we fight over it. All right, that was, so that's number six, Joe's Crow from Game, <laughs> game of Thrones, the right. board game. 
My number five is Time Turns from eBay, the electronic auction game. Now, you know that I, I tend to be annoyed at people sometimes when they take too long playing a game. In eBay, the electronic talking game, you don't have time to do that. It will say, red, and then the red, whoever's red it is has to play a card down and press the button because if they don't do it within, what, five seconds, then it goes, ah, and they lost a turn, and then it's blue, and then it's blue's turn. So if you take too long, you got to put it down. I like timers in games. Um, really? I don't, I don't think timers are needed in all games. I don't. But for example, Joe and I just played Dungeon Twister. I think Dungeon <laughs> Twister would do great with a two-minute timer per turn. Yeah. Because there's so many things you can do on your turn. Paralysis. To the system. Um, I like um, they added a timer in, in the new Robo Rally. There's a game, Tamsk, I think that's the right way to pronounce it, T-A-M-S-K, that the pieces are timers, which... Changes the game that I might oh, find yeah. a bit boring. That's it's a really interesting. Game. I played that. You, you got to flip your timers over before they run out. And I like games like that, but my favorite is eBay, the electronic talking game, because it sits there and goes red, blue. So why, <laughs> didn't, why didn't you like Omega Virus? Because that's a timed game that yells. Because at Omega you. Virus is like, you're going to lose. You you're so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and not to mention the fact that Omega Virus is totally random. And we're all playing against the game. It's and, not oh, totally random. And eBay, the auction game, you're. You're playing against other players. Alrighty. All right. My number five is from the game Starfares of Catan. Starfares of Catan is basically a ripoff of Settlers of Catan, which has been rethemed. <laughs> it's it's been the same design. I know. It's just been rethemed, which is a much better theme, which much better better bits and candy. I own this game. I don't own Star. I don't own Settlers. But anyway, the the bit of this game and the mechanic is they have these little 1950s reminiscent rocket ships, and they're really big. They're like the size of a big coffee cup, and you you flip them over on your turn when you roll. Basically, it's your die roll mechanic, and uh, the little little these little uh, there's red, black, and uh, blue little balls that are inside this little clear tube on the bottom of your rocket ship, and those little balls when they fall out the bottom, that tells you what happens on your turn. So it's just really it's just really cool, and it just it just adds to the whole game. I I love the, sh- the flipping the rocket ships over to see what happens. Yeah, and I, I mean, that to me is a really fun thing, just to flip your rocket ship over. In fact, there's another game I have, um, I, oh, the name of it escapes me, but it uses a big thing that does the same thing. You put the balls on the top, you turn it over, and they come down in order. I'll talk about that game in a future week. So that's not Joe's number five. My number four is Connecting Tiles. My wife and I played Carcassonne on Sunday, and we played it, the original version, we put with Builders and Traders, with the River expansion, with the first expansion, with the Princess and the Dragon expansion, and with an expansion that came from a German magazine. We didn't play with the Count of Carcassonne, just because we were trying not to overwhelm ourselves oh too my. much. But beyond all the different rules, you know, we're, 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 my wife and I are pretty much Carcassonne experts, so it's not like it boggles our minds too much. But the I like Carcassonne's way of just attaching the tiles together. Other games do it, like Sunda to Sahu. Or, um, so what? Who would the who? Yeah, it's a it's a game that looks like puzzle pieces attached, huh. or wooly bully, but Carcassonne is just so simplistic. You just connect the tiles, you hook the cities up together, you watch things grow. I really really like Carcassonne for that. Cool. So that's my number four. My number four is a, is a is an old game. It's called Ace of Aces. Now, Ace of Aces is uh, a, a game that simulates World War One dogfighting, and uh, I think there's three or four different uh, versions or expansions. No, there's, there's at least six. Is it? There's quite a few. You can get them fairly cheap on eBay. They're definitely out of production. Um, anyway, and in Ace of Aces, all it is is each player gets a little uh, like notepad and a little book. And you turn to a certain page number, and it shows you the actual picture of, a, of an airplane uh, from the point of view of the guy flying the plane. And so you see your dashboard, and you can see your machine gun. And, and so you're trying to maneuver your plane to shoot each other down by getting you into crosshairs. And so you look at the bottom of the page as a little... Um, I mean, I'm going to do a review of this game in the future. I'm not going to give too much away. But I just like the the aspect of the card. I mean, the game is a book, and each player has a book. And that's just, to me, is just really it's kind cool. of like choose your own adventure, but right. it's a game. You know, I'm going to review this game next week. So well, I'm not gonna... you, you can basically just say, you pick a move or your opponent picks a move or it tells you what page you turn to, and then it shows where you are now. Yeah, it's just really cool. It's a little confusing, I at think. First, at first. It's and cool, because you and I played it, we were turning the page and we're like, what? <laughs> this isn't right, because we were doing it wrong. Backwards, but this is the kind of game you can sit in the back seat of your car on the family trip and you can throw it to your kids and say, hey kids, shut up, play this game. And the son and daughter can have dog fights for an hour. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of airplane games fighting games, but I, I really do want to pick up one of these copies of Aces to Aces. It's just a neat game. Yeah. My number three is the turn markers from Tom Jolly's Camelot. 
Um, Joe and I already talked about it and discussed on why I liked it and he didn't like it. It was very chaotic. But there was no denying it's a really neat, it's called the lightning system, where I have a turn marker. Well, it's a patented in lightning right. system. <laughs> I have a turn marker, and Joe has a turn marker. And if when I'm done with my turn, I give my turn marker to the next person who doesn't have one. So if Joe's to my left, and I'm about to give him a marker, and he's still taking his time, I skip him and give it to another person. So you can take all the time you want in your turn, but other people are going to pass you up. And I think it's a really neat idea. I like to see it applied to other games. Cool. I, that, was, that was pretty cool. Now, I changed mine. I had something else down, but I, I changed mine. For my third, I have went with Fortress America, the satellites for the American player. Oh, my and goodness. I, I just, I really? Just, I just really like that aspect of the game because uh, Fortress America is an old Hasbro company, old, old Hasbro game that was out in uh, the Game Master series of the 1980s. And one player is the American player. Then you have the, the evil three forces. It's a copy of... Um, Gary's great, my friend Gary's my friend Gary's favorite game. Um, what's that game called? Invasion America. Basically, it's a simpler version of America. Anyway, in the game, the American player, you know, every turn he gets one more satellite, and he can strategically place these in one of his cities. And a satellite basically gets a free attack at the enemies, and so the enemy really has to move fast, otherwise these satellites are going to overpower him. And they're just cool to roll for the satellites. And this is like it's the kind of thing you want in any game to be able to target any opponent's unit anywhere in the board. You, yeah, <laughs> you can pick a unit that you want, and you can kill that unit. And it, this is where the FX guy comes into play because every time you roll for the satellite, some guy's always like. Zap! You know, and takes off a piece off the board or whatever. So the satellites from Fortress America, I just love them. My number two is the dice from War of the Ring. In War of the Ring, each turn you roll dice. Although the dark side, the dark side, <laughs> the 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 shadow, they decide how many of the of the dice they're going to. Are you done now? <laughs> But it's not how many dice are going to allocate the hunting for the ring. But you roll the dice, and then those dice determine what actions you can do that turn. And then, of course, each action, you have a lot of choices. But it really, it kind of gives you a, a focus as to what strategic options you're going to take. And I, I thought it was very, very clever. The dice, the dice actions was just a really good idea. It really works well for that game. So that's my number two, the dice, action dice from War of the Ring. Cool. My number two is actually a type of combat system, but it's um, it's it's from ASL Advanced Squad Leader, and it's just the defensive fire. Now, let me just give you a quick explanation of what that is and why I like it. And and I've played so many different war games, and especially like miniature games like Warhammer 40K and different games. And uh, it's you move, I move, you move, I move, and that's fine for a game, but it doesn't really simulate what it's really like uh, to be in combat, I'm sure. And so, uh, because you can just, if you've moved, and you're done. And so now my guys can just run across the map. Woohoo, you can't shoot me, even though you're standing there. Especially if you've played 40K, you know what I'm talking about. Your whole huge army is just standing there. Meanwhile, the enemy just walks right in front of you. And so I really, I've always kind of been discontent with that kind of part of the game. Well, a defensive fire in ASL basically does not allow that. If you move out in front of me, you're going to get shot. I don't care whose turn it is. And so that that aspect, I just, I love, that's one of the things that's really brought me into ASL. ASL is defensive fire, and it's confusing. <laughs> the defensive fire, because there's there's first if there's first fire defensive fire, there's subsequent first fire, there's final protective fire, and then you know, so and learning when you can qualify to do each of these things. But anyway, once you learn it, it's just really cool. And my number one is also a semi. Oh, I guess it's a form of combat, but it's the cube tower from Wallenstein, or from the Crusades game. That's very similar to Wallenstein. Basically, I throw my armies in the top, you throw your armies in the top, and the ones that come out are the winners. And it's it's probably not as statistically accurate as dice. There's probably <laughs> problems with it. It's but cool. There's just something cool about throwing the cubes in the tower and seeing which come out. I could care less if it. They could use it for anything, not even a combat system. It could be stocks in the stock market. Put that cube tower in a game, and I will buy it. That's how cool it is. My, uh, it's my hands-down favorite mechanic in any this, game. That game's a game that you want to avoid when my next week player category guy is around. And my player category next week, I don't want to give it away, but you don't want that dice tar around when he is in the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I already know what person this is. But, All, right. Okay. All right. My number one game mechanic is definitely from Diplomacy. And Diplomacy no. is the old 1950s game. It's been around, still going strong. But this is simultaneous revel- revealing of written orders. This is where everyone writes down what you want to do on a piece of paper. You wheel and deal, and then all at once you take them out, and someone has to read them out loud. And just look on each other's faces across the room as the evil eyes stare at each other as people lie and get betrayed. I just love that part of the game. That's my number one thing. 
All right, don't forget, if you have been listening and you want to you want to look up more information on those, you can go to our website at www.thedicetower.com. You can see our top ten games there and click on a link to each game with more information on it. And I just want to say one last thing before we close. Is today is my daughter's third birthday, Jessica Lynn Stedman, and you can see pictures of her on my blog. And happy birthday, Jesse. And happy birthday, Jessica. And don't forget to email us. Don't forget to enter the contest for the game and sign poster. I mean, it's a really good prize. We hope you do it. We'd like to thank everyone for their participation in the last contest. Yeah. And we'd like to congratulate Keep up the emails. Uh, I mean, Jeff Knox once again for winning it. And, you know, email us, Jeff, and we'll give you information on how to get that game. And uh, Keep up the emails. Keep up the questions. And uh, we, we thank you for your support. And we'll see you next time. This is Tom Vassell. And I'm Joe Stedman. Thanks for listening to the Dice Tower. Oh, I guess I should turn the sound back up so we can hear the theme. <laughs> Why can't I hear the theme? Uh, remember, we were recorded live. Yeah, we were a big fan of that recording live because really, when you say you record live, you can pretty much excuse any mistake on that. Oh, we, you know, messed up there. Well, we were recording live. I, you know, I, I I look at my notes and I really can't remember when we stopped recording and started editing stuff. Um, I thought it was around now, but apparently, according to comments like that, it wasn't, or at least maybe. Joe thought it wasn't. It's interesting how we look at some of the games here uh, that we thought would be the next big thing, and maybe and, and they weren't. A good one in this one would be Beowulf. I, I still do enjoy Beowulf. I think it's a, a, an excellent auction game, one of the last good games I've seen Knizia produce in a while. And just it, it just didn't take off, I guess, as much as people thought it would. And you don't hear much talk about it now at all, although I still think it's a pretty good game. But it is interesting. The next big thing, and then several years later, no one talks about it anymore. There's a lot of games like that. Maybe we should do a top ten list on it one time. But I do have to say that the top ten list we did in this episode is one of my favorites. Not that the list itself, but the idea, the top ten game mechanics. And I tell you, I have some... Some more to add to that list. That will be a list that we will be redoing in the future. Although you'll also hear a top 10 combat mechanics list too. Uh, that's something I've been thinking about lately. And so I'm still flowing with those top 10 ideas. Uh, eventually we'll run out. But that, hopefully that will be by episode 250 or something. And by that time our show will be over. There will be the Dice Tower Junior. And our kids will be doing the show. Well anyway. See you soon. In episode 124, which I think will be posted pretty close at the same time as this one. And Musings on number 5, which will have a recap of a lot of my Origins adventures. Until next time, this is Tom Vassell, and you've been listening to the Dice Tower Classic. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed this show, we ask you to check out the website, www.thedicetower.com, for more information about us and about the games we love. We'd like to thank Your Move Games for their sponsorship. Check out www.yourmovegames.com to find out why Battleground Fantasy Warfare made Tom's top ten games of all time. Or join in the discussion on their forums. Until next week, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Dice Tower.